we're about to shift from terrestrial habitats and soundscapes into marine soundscapes. And um, most of us haven't spent a lot of time in the water, so we assume that it's, it's not really filled with sounds, but um, in fact, it's a very creative place for, for sound development, especially with uh, the whales and dolphins. And sound is a very important component for animals like whales and dolphins because when you're in the water, uh, the visible light is really reduced the deeper you get. So by the time you're down a couple hundred feet, it's pretty dark. And um, also the color drops out. So it's, uh, it's all you can see is at that depth is, is shadows. And then when you get far enough deep, it's totally black. So for an animal to communicate and be aware of its surroundings, sound is a perfect component. And sound has the advantage in the water of traveling five times faster in water than on land. And consequently, it also travels five times farther uh, underwater than on land. Um, so, in thinking about the ocean, which covers 71% of the surface of our planet, uh, it's, it's an area that has a lot of patchy resources. There's areas like uh, when the Humboldt current is coming up this side of South America, it's bringing up cold nutrients that uh, create all the bloom of, of uh, uh, phytoplankton, then zooplankton, then larger copepods, crustaceans, krill, that the bigger herring start to feed on, and then the tuna, dolphins, humpback whales, blue whales, but it's a very patchy system. So a lot of the times, the animals are, are in a search. They're in certain areas at certain times of the year. And in the case of humpback whales, uh, which we saw the spectrogram early in the program, um, they're animals that migrate between their wintering area, which is in the tropics where the females raise their calves, they have their calves, they raise them, the males come to the area and try to breed with the females, but they're not eating. They're, they're more concerned with, with raising calves and mating. And so they end up going to their summer areas, which in the case of the southern hemisphere, is down all around the Antarctic Peninsula where there's incredible krill uh, abundance. So all the whales in the southern hemisphere will be around the Antarctic continent uh, during their summer and they can pack on enough food in five months, six months there in Antarctica to sustain them throughout their wintering period in the tropics. And in the northern hemisphere uh, there's kind of a break between the Atlantic humpback whales and the Pacific humpback whales. In the Pacific, where we are, they'll uh, winter in Hawaii, and, and generally, and along the coast of Mexico, Costa Rica, and in Japan, and then come summertime, they're all going up to southeast Alaska, where we saw that first slide of the bubble net feeding and all the humpback whales coming up in the bubble in that. So um, there's a lot of movement in the ocean. Animals are in certain areas at certain times because there's more food. Um, so that's, that's an important understanding is the patchiness of, of the food distribution in the ocean. I want to start with the humpback whales because they're they're known for their songs, and um, actually I'll, I'll play some songs. This is from the original recording that was actually uh, made by a naval engineer. Uh, some of the earliest recordings um, were found through hydrophone recordings after the Second, or during the Second World War when they were trying to find submarines. 
and they'd find uh, these sounds that eventually they understood were being made by animals, and specifically whales and, and dolphins. And so this engineer uh, eventually showed a couple biologists uh, that subsequently became champions for whales, Roger Payne and his wife, Katie Payne. And they took the recordings that Frank Watmington, the naval engineer, provided them and made a CD called Sounds of the Humpback Whale, which was the first time that pub the public was able to hear these songs and then realize how majestic these animals were. And that instead of intensively hunting them to the brink of extinction, it was time to think about a different relationship to have with whales and dolphins. And that led to uh, some of the early bands on, on whaling. Um, so this was a, a, an incredible feat of conservation that was done through sounds, uh, specifically the sounds of the humpback whales. So I'll play part of that, that recording that was made in the 1970s, um, put together by Frank Watlington and championed by Roger and Katie Payne. This is too loud. So these songs are made by uh, the, the males only. Unlike birds where most of the time it's just the males, but quite often, especially in the tropics, the female birds would be singing. Uh, we have some birds in our area that will sing, some of our owls will sing, the females. But for the humpback whales, this is, probably, this is all the males that are singing. In this case, this is a mother with her calf, and this is a male escort. And uh, when you're in the water with humpback whales, and there's a, a male escort and it's singing, this is exactly what you hear without any kind of amplification. I mean, it's a, just a strong signal, and you can feel it in your bones, depending on how close you are to the whale. And these songs are very organized and structured. So they have uh, themes that are made of um, phrases and units, and they'll sing theme A with the phrases and units of theme A. They'll go to theme B, theme, theme C, theme D, theme E, and then go back to theme A and start all, all the way through again. So uh, I'll explain a little bit about the recent finds about humpback sounds, but songs, but I want to go to the other sounds that the humpback whales make as well. And here's uh, a humpback whale breaching. And for any whale and dolphin, if they want to be acrobatic and jump, breach out of the water and go head first without making the splash, they're totally capable of doing it. But this isn't what they're trying to do. They're trying to make the loudest splash that they can so when they breach out of the water, they're trying to do a big cannonball with their body. And that's one of the ways that they can project information about size of the males and strength of the males. And of course, the humpback bubble feeding system is another example where uh, in that first picture that I showed um, at the beginning of the presentation, you had 15 humpback males that were emerging from the bubble net in one synchronized unit. And this is incredible precision. And they do this all day long in the waters of southeast Alaska where the, uh, the food that they have is so abundant. And they have duties. Each of the uh, whales has a duty within the bubble net hunting strategy and they all come up in the same position, so there's no confusion about how to maximize the amount of mouths that are coming up within the bubble net to capture their, their food. And the sounds of the bubbles uh, are, what, are one of the things that drives the prey to be clustered into a tiger ball that the humpback whales come in between.
So there's been a, a wonderful study that just came out in the last few years that showed how humpback whale songs evolve. Because generally, the humpback whales will sing the same song, it'll, it'll be slightly changing over time when they're in their wintering area, and then they'll kind of stop the song development, they'll go down to their summer feeding area, and when they come back to the winter area, they pick up the song exactly where it was when they left it. So this particular slide shows a study where they were able to sample the humpback whale songs in each of these locations, which is 4,000 miles between East Australia and in an easterly direction it goes eventually to French Polynesia, 4,000 miles. So you can see that what they were able to find is that they could see the different songs were mostly coming from Eastern Australia and then starting to go further east over successive years uh, until it finally reached the farthest each point, farthest each point, east point. And um, in one case, they actually had a whale that took a song that had moved from Eastern Australia over the years to French Polynesia and it went around Cape Horn in South America, and it was in the Atlantic. So this is an example, one of the best examples, that humans aren't the only animal to have culture. When you think about change in animals, including humans, we can change through our genetic makeup, we are changed by the environment that we're in, and culture is the latest agent of change. And with humans, uh, we've been able to do amazing things with, with, uh, through our cultural development. Um, but we're not the only ones, and humpback whales and their song are one of the best examples of change within the lifetime of a single animal that gets moved from one area to the next. And we have blue whales, which generally, unless you're in an area with, with really high productivity, blue whales are, tend to be um, by themselves. They're the largest planet, or the largest animal that's ever lived on our planet. Um, here we have a blue whale mother with her calf. Um, and people thought, well, well blue whales, um, they, they don't gather in, in big groups, but I think our understanding of what blue whales are doing is changing based on the understanding that blue whales have the lowest sound, their, their sound production is the lowest sound production on the planet. Uh, they can make sounds obviously in the infras infrasonic range that we can't hear, but if we were next to a blue whale when it had 180 decibels of, of infrasonic sound that we couldn't hear. Our body would just be rocking. Um, and consequently, because of its large size, uh, the sounds are low, and low sounds travel the farthest in the ocean. So there's an understanding that some of these blue whale songs can go across a thousand miles or more and be heard by other whales. So instead of the concept of whales being, blue whales being isolated in this big expanse of, of an ocean basin, they're actually in communication with the other whales through sound. And unfortunately, our impact on the, on the soundscapes of the ocean, our human impact, is making significant changes uh, in what the whales are able to hear based on things like our engine noise from boats, our sonar use for uh, drilling, and other um, frequency noises. So we're changing the environments for blue whales, so that capacity to hear across an entire ocean basin may be at risk. And these down here are sperm whales. And they, they look like, oh my goodness, they're not streamlined, they're, they don't have that graceful blue whale look, or 
or a dolphin look, but what we're looking at is the largest sound producing organ of any animal on the planet. And what sperm whales in this area here, it's, it's uh, about 30% of their body is their sound producing organ, which produces clicks, directional clicks. So inside the head of sperm whales, there's a lot of high refined oil there's muscle, and there's a lot of uh, connected air sacs. And so the sperm whale is able to take sounds, you know, from where they generate, uh, they get the air from their blowhole. Uh, it'll move through the air sacs and go through all these interconnected networks and come out the very front as a very targeted sonar system and they're relying on echolocation clicks. So they'll be, uh, and it's, it's just a really simple click. It's click, 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 and as they dive, they'll go diving down up to 4,000 feet deep to get squid in the, uh, the darkness, with the exception of bioluminescence that's available down in, at the depths. So they're going down, and, and you can listen to them, and it goes click, click. And as they get closer to their play, prey, it goes click, 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 because the time interval, they're waiting. These clicks are really short for echolocation and for sonar. You want short, very directional uh, clicks, because you're listening for the echo to come back, and that's going to give you information on distance to your prey, the shape of the prey, what direction the prey is going, uh, the orientation of the prey, all of those things you can tease out through echolocation clicks. So as the uh, sperm whale is getting closer to the squid, it'll go cluck, 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 really, this buzz of clicks and then silence. And, and that's when it's, it's got the, the squid. And so these sperm whales live in matrilineal groups, meaning they're groups that live, that stay with the mother. And so we'll have the matriarch and her offspring, her daughters and calves, there may be four generations that are in a clan of sperm whales. And when they're at the surface, uh, they'll share codas um, that'll be not as focused as the clicks, not as loud as the clicks, they're just, they're more of a social, uh, cohesion sound that they give that's specific to the clan. There be there may be another clan a mile over that has a completely different coda structure, and never the two will will cross. They they maintain their coda structure for their specific matrilineal clan. So another thing that they do is they'll be at the surface, and if they all go down as a group, if they have young, they'll leave. Uh, Baby centers on top with the calves, whether it's the daughters or one of the or the matriarch. Um, so they'll kind of reunite at the surface and exchange codas and and move along as the group. And um, it's it's just a wonderful society, of sperm whales. And now we're going to deal with the orcas, and they have. We're really fortunate here to be living so close to one of the longest studies of, of killer whales uh, that we have in science um, because there's been 35 years of study on killer whales in Puget Sound and off Vancouver Island and up in southeast Alaska. And what they found is that there's different killer whale ecotypes. So there's a resident, what's known as a resident killer whale, which is uh, these are uh, southern residents in Puget Sound. And residents focus on eating fish. Specifically, they like Chinook salmon. That's the, that's the top of, uh, of the line for, for these orcas. And then there's transients that are, uh, they live on seals and sea lions. And then there's offshore ecotype killer whales that feed on sharks and large fish, but they're, they're offshore. So they have the capacity to interbreed, but they don't because their behavior, which is specifically tied to a, 
a certain way that they gather food keeps them separate. And also, they have completely different sound systems or sound uh, dialects. And they operate differently in terms of if um, the resident killer whales make a lot of voc vocalizations because they're trying to catch salmon, which doesn't have as good a hearing as the transient food, which is the seals and sea lions. So the residents are making a lot of noise in their, in their feedings. The transients are quiet and because they know that their seals and sea lions are listening for the transient vocalizations. And when the seals and sea lions hear the transient killer whales, they scamper out on rocks and head to uh, safe areas that the killer whales can't get to them. On the other hand, if those seals and sea lions hear a resident killer whale, it ignores it. So it's a very tight ecosystem, and these dialects um, are specific to the different orca clans. I know there's a lot of terminology, but orcas have their matrilineal. The uh, offspring will stay with the mother throughout their entire lives. And so a number of uh, matrilines um, will meet and, and uh, form pods. A number of pods will gather into clans and then a number of clans will gather into a community. And so we have the south, uh, the southern community of Puget Sound and south, southern Vancouver Island. We have the community of North Vancouver Island, and we have the community of Southeast Alaska. And uh, we've got, we know all of their identity down to each pod member. It's, it's that specific on the information that's been able to be gathered about uh, killer whales. And killer whales, they are the apex predator in the ocean. They'll take on gray whales, they'll take on sperm whale calves, and uh, blue whale calves. They are the animal that everybody fears. And predation is one factor that's really led to societies developing. It probably led to human societies gathering together for defense against the surrounding predators. For sure, it's the case with, with the uh, other animals in the ocean aside from the killer whales.